it's great to be with you all. I'm honored to be uh, uh, learning with you today. I'm going to get up some images uh, uh, and we'll have a meditation shortly as well. Yeah, I think you're seeing okay then Paul Gauguin's work uh, translated uh, from the uh, uh, French. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? It was painted during 1897, 1898 oil on canvas. Gauguin had made a great trip to Tahiti and he was learning about the arts and culture there. You know, this is a work that's in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. I know some of you have seen the actual original there. These are important questions about where do we come from? What are we, where are we going? I think for many of us, these are part of the motivations that led us to be interested in mysticism and spirituality, and in particular, to become a student of the Rosicrucian order. Now, one of the important keys for answering these questions is the law of correspondence, that the microcosm is, uh, is corresponds to the macrocosm. And we're gonna deal with that topic today in our presentation entitled, The Microcosms. To prepare now for our meditation, including with these profound questions that mysticism uh, answers in our own or through our own self-discovery that the order guides us through. I'm going to show you uh, another work of art. It's by Hakan Hassim, and I thank Ingrid for introducing me to this artist. The work is entitled Universal Transmissions 8, Recursive Pantheism, and it dates from around 2017. It's a digital work, but it's and uh, printed out in various formats. You'll find in here a wealth of symbolism, and I will elaborate uh, after our meditation a, a little more on some of the uh, uh, important earlier mystical diagrams and influences that could be for this particular work. But you'll see that at the center, there's the human, that we are a uh, holy temple uh, as a microcosm, reflecting the entirety of creation, all the laws and principles of creation associated with our Rosicrucian laws and principles. But they're symbolized here in the form like in a vault, all these mystical laws and principles. Those that are within us as a microcosm are mirrored in those in the cosmos. In knowing ourselves, know thyself, one has the capacity then to know all others and why they're experiencing things the way they are, but also have a deeper understanding of the cosmos and our place in it and help answer those questions from Paul Gauguin's work. So take a little time to look at this inspiring work and notice it has a, a spiraling uh, motion or spiral coming in uh, towards the heart uh, at its center. We'll apply this now in our meditation. And after our meditation, we'll pick up the topic of microcosms even more. So at this time, We'll follow the, the booklet Lieber 777. We'll give some references for you uh, at the end of our presentation for various items that are referring to you. But we'll going to ascend now to the heights of the celestial sanctum. So I invite you now to sit comfortably in your chair or how you wish, however you wish to be positioned. And you can have your spine upright, which is our cosmic axis as a microcosm of the macrocosm. You can have your hands in your laps, palms down, legs at right angles at the knees with the feet flat on the floor about eight inches apart, I suggest. And in this position, take some deep neutral breaths, either holding the inhalation or holding the exhalation. Just enjoy the gentle rhythm of the breath. Breathe a little slower and a little deeper than you do usually. This will allow what the Rosicrucians refer to as the cosmic essence and the vital life force to come more and more into your holy temple of your body. And you'll feel a wonderful tonic tingling sensation. Just continue to take these deep neutral breaths. This helps us commune and resonate with all the vibrations of the macrocosm, the microcosm, as, in, as we, the microcosm. Gradually, we'll expand our awareness 
from that of the microcosm to the macrocosm. So they are one. They correspond to each other, as above, so below, in other words. Now, as we prepare to begin our great ascent, let us say together, May the divine essence of the cosmic infuse my being and cleanse me of all impurities of mind and body that I may enter the celestial sanctum and attune in pureness and in worthiness. So be it in truth, so mote it be. And Rosicrucians use the word cosmic to refer to the cosmos, but also all natural and spiritual laws guiding that cosmos and universe and the universal intelligence back of the universe. Now picture in your mind rising up and from the room where you are, up over the house or dwelling where you are, and continue the ascent, seeing below you your neighborhood, see the system and order of the streets and the architecture, and keep rising up faster and faster and see the city or town or larger ge geographic area where you are, Start to rise above any clouds or weather systems into the beautiful sunlight and see below also the province or city or province or state where you live. And see the larger weather systems and the land forms and the water forms with rivers or lakes or oceans and keep rising higher and higher, faster and faster till you see the great nation where you dwell. See its landforms and its structure and radiate love and well being down to all sentient beings and humans back there in your nation. And continue to rise faster and faster. Use great inner force. Now is not the time to be passive. We'll be passive when we reach the heights of the celestial sanctum. And see below you now the continent where you dwell and even the hemisphere where you dwell. As we move faster and faster, take in the earth as a whole, the beautiful blue jewel, the great globe of the earth, the temple of the earth, our home. Feel a degree of gratitude for this special place to live as it travels fast through space, as we rotate around the great fiery ball of the sun, which we see now in the solar system and the various planets, the huge planet of Jupiter and the beautiful rings of Saturn and the red planet Mars, and Mercury and Venus. Feel the very psychic, subtle and psychic influences from these planets and the sun. Now, as we pass beyond the solar system, look up to the myriad stars and stellar phenomena like quasars and pulsars and supernovae bursting forth with tremendous light and also sense the presence of various sized black holes that help keep the balance, the order and balance, the great universe in balance. Pass by myriad stars and nebulae. And start to sense the great structure of the spiraling galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, our home, and pass right out from it at tremendous speed, way beyond the speed of light for our transcending space and time now. And look back at the Milky Way galaxy and sense its great revolving action about its center. And look up and see other galaxies, nebulae. And sense the stupendous harmony and order of it all. and work psychically and spiritually to take in a far wider range of vibrations than we normally can as a human. Full range of vibrations that the Rosicrucians refer to as being on the cosmic keyboard, like a great extended keyboard of successive octaves, subtler and subtler vibrations, vibrating faster and faster. 
take in this great harmony of the spheres that have been spoken by mystics since ancient times and continue to travel faster and faster. So you're taking in not only galaxies now, but super clusters of galaxies. You see the great order in which this is all unfolding and happening in the cosmos. Keep moving, speed up faster and faster. And as we move out farther and farther from Earth, by the law of correspondence, the microcosm, the macrocosm, we will be simultaneously moving deeper and deeper spiritually within our nature to the master within, the God within. Keep moving in this great ascent towards the celestial sanctum. And now as you're taking in all the, you know, all the galaxies and super clusters of galaxies, sense the great revolving action about a great cosmic axis, the entire universe revolving about a world axis spoken of by mystics and philosophers since antiquity. Move very fast towards the very midpoint of that axis. But instead of stopping and slowing up there, sense in this great literal and symbolic journey that there's a large black hole close to that midpoint of the, of the great cosmic axis. Come in low over the event horizon, far faster than the speed of light, and go right through the black hole and enjoy the wonders of traveling through a black hole that astrophysicists have spoken about. And going way beyond the speed of light, take in the sights and sounds and higher rates of vibrations through the black hole, uninhibited as we travel at tremendous speed. And you'll see in the distance, another exit out from a black hole, lead towards it. And when you've come out from it, slow up all the way from the black hole and look about you. I invite you now to see tremendous range of celestial bodies, all highly ordered above you, to your left, to your right and below you. They are the nature that the mystic philosopher Giordano Bruno spoke of, and many philosophers and mystics since medieval and ancient times. And indeed, the great wisdom of the ancient texts of India, the Vedas, spoke of as well. For all these celestial bodies that you see orderly around us, they're not moons. They're not planets, they're not stars, they're not nebulae, they're not galaxies, they're universes. You're seeing all the universes now around you. Take in this stupendous harmony and order of this greater cosmos. And since that our universe revolves about its great axis here, we're at the midpoint of the great axis of the cosmos and see the great revolving action of all the universes encompassing past, present and future and eternity now. All the potentialities that we've ever visualized revolving about us in the universes. And once you've taken in this exhilarating and most profound of sights, I invite you to visualize your celestial sanctum, which may continue in the form of seeing all these multiple universes, or you, which is the great temple of the divine. Or you may wish to picture your celestial sanctum as some inspiring sacred grove of trees in nature, or a high vantage point from a mountain, or maybe on the high banks of a river an ocean or a lake and seeing the ripples of the waves below suggestive of infinity and the cosmic consciousness. Or you may wish to picture the Grand Lodge in San Jose, California and its Egyptian motifs or a Christian cathedral or church or a Buddha stupa or a Sikh Padara. 
or Jewish synagogue. Fill in all the sights and sounds of your celestial sanctum. You may wish to picture inspiring symbols there on stained glass windows and incense elevating the mind and consciousness. And see, sense other seekers and Rosicrucians with you, like mind on the mystic path. Coming into a greater understanding of natural and spiritual laws, exemplified in the microcosm within us and the macrocosms all about us. And when you're ready, dwell for a time in deep silence. Rosicrucians refer to as peace profound, the most profound form of peace at the center of your being, at the center of the cosmos. Following the inspiration of Elkan Hesim's cosmic work of art, I invite you to picture a great spiraling action around you going in counterclockwise motion, spiraling around your holy temple, 12 revolutions, ultimately ending at the heart. But starting with the pineal gland, Make 12 revolutions counterclockwise. With each revolution, go through one of the 12 psychic centers. Start now and make this great winding 12 times in towards your heart, which will prepare us for further spiritual operations based in the heart. Begin now, riders and slowers and participants. And as you go over this great winding, spoken of by the master Jacob Bohm, I think you'll find an even greater exhilaration and feeling of the cosmic essence within your holy temple. And as you pass through each psychic center, they're activated and charged and balanced. When you reach the heart center, let us use the great charge being at the center of cosmos, the center of our being. Having done the great winding, the psychic centers to the heart. Let us radiate love and well-being out from our heart. Our outer nature will act as an instrument, a channel. Let the divine within radiate this love and well-being out from you to all those in need throughout the universes. All those who've petitioned our Grand Lodge for healing, all those who petitioned your affiliate bodies for healing, all those you know are in need for healing to make whole. Radiate love and well-being out to them all now. Let the rays of love and well-being spread out into the vast expanse of the great cosmos and universes, filling them and enriching them through the action of the divine within. Feel the exhilaration of the flow. Of 
a certain point, I think you'll find that you can be passive again for the flow of love and well-being will continue without conscious effort. And in time, it'll speed up when you know your recipients are receiving now. When that happens, dwell again. Centered on the divine within the God of our hearts. In deep stillness. And as the love and well-being flows, there may be a message from the master within that comes forward. And so take note of it, but return to dwelling on the heart. Feel whatever there is to feel. Meditation is an act of non-avoidance. Whatever arises, take note. Return to the breath. This deep, still center at the center of your being. The center of the great cosmos. I will formally conclude this period of radiating love and well and being, but not of our meditation yet. We've done this as an act of service and cosmic attunement, as part of the work of the Silent Council, in conjunction of the Council of Solace of our Grand Lodge, as an act of humanitarianism and for health of healing of all in need. I'll say, if it pleases the cosmic, it is done. So be it in truth, so mote it be. Now let us dwell a while longer at the heights of the celestial sanctum before we begin our great descent. At this great still center, we feel the cosmic mind and merge with one with the cosmic mind and cosmic consciousness, the consciousness of the cosmic now. And I will conclude this period of meditation, assured that the love and well-being will continue to radiate to those in need as a way of life. And this attunement with the cosmic will continue with us at all times in a balanced state of consciousness. Let us depart from this great center of the, of the cosmos with all the universes revolving about us. Let us build up speed now far beyond the speed of light and go back through the great black hole that we went through earlier. And take in the exhilarating sights and sounds of this passage as we see the exit back into our universe at the center of the universe. We return there 
continue on past the great clusters of galaxies and all the myriad stars and stellar phenomena, the quasars and the pulsars, the supernova and the other black holes and see far in the distance, the great spiraling galaxy that is the Milky Way galaxy, our home. And going faster and faster, zoom in on the great arm where our solar system is and pass into the Milky Way galaxy inside, past the myriad stars and stellar phenomena and the great system and order and beauty and colors of it all. And see in the far distance, our solar system when it's harmonious motions about the sun and home in now on the sun and the beautiful blue jewel of the earth. And if you come to the beautiful blue jewel of the earth, see the hemisphere where you dwell and the continent and then the country and then the province or state as we slow up, say with me, May the God of my heart sanctify this attunement of self with the celestial sanctum. So be it in truth, so mote it be. And now let's continue down into our geographic area, our city or town, our neighborhood, the home where we left and then back in the room where we are. And since the body and its chair, whatever position it is, the holy temple, it is the microcosm of the macrocosm. And when you're ready, stretch, feel invigorated, rejuvenated, remade, and reborn. Is this work and worship of the Rosicrucian Order and Lord. You may open your eyes whenever you wish, and we'll continue with our presentation on the microcosms. Now the microcosm it can, it means world in miniature from the Greek, the small world. And it matches or mirrors a larger world, the macrocosm. And in understanding the microcosm, the macrocosm is a key to answering those questions that Paul Gauguin posed about the meaning and purpose of our existence and where we're going. But also helps with our self mastery and having a great sense of harmony. In this diagram, we see before us this artwork, Universal Transmissions 8, Recursive Pantheism. There's many surprising elements of it, but I think you'll find from your studies in mysticism, a lot of familiar things. For example, I'll show you another microcosm that's associated with it, the vault of Christian Rosicruns or the vault of CRC. You recall from the opening of the vault of CRC, Department of Instruction teleconference, we went into great detail on it, and you may wish to view that again. This is a model by the inspired artist and designer, Jeff Hoke, and it's titled The Tomb of Illumination Model that one can make from cardstock or paper from the Museum of Lost Wonder. I'll give you a reference for it later in this presentation when Karen pastes into the group chat. But here we see the vault or CRC that is spoken of in the Fema Fraternitatis around 1614, one of the great manifestos that the Rosicrucians made themselves known again, the new cycle of activity in the world. Inside the vault that the Rosicrucians students opened, they found that it was a miniature world with all natural and spiritual laws depicted around its seven sides, similar to the way that the artist Hakim Asim has depicted various laws and principles of creation within the sacred sanctuary of his structure where the human being as a microcosm is pictured. Here too, we see an altar uh, with a special microcosmic um, body within it and the body of Christian Rosa Christ, Christ <coughs> lying there as a microcosm or a macrocosm. In a way, we see a depiction of all our Rosicrucian studies here and of the cosmos. Also a mnemonic device for remembering all our Rosicrucian teachings. Another great depiction of the microcosm is one that's influential for this Hakim Hassan work, I think as well, is Leonardo da Vinci's drawing of what's been called Vitruvian Man. 
It's a drawing based on the ideal human proportions described in the ancient Roman text, the 10 books of architecture by the author Vitruvius. And you'll see the great circle and square there that are forming together in their sacred application of geometry by which the microcosm matches the macrocosm through the fourfold structure that is throughout the cosmos, such as the four, the four winds or the four elements uh, or the uh, four seasons or the four bodily fluids within the holy temple of the body and the circle depicting the great cyclic action and suggestive unendingness. Similar to that microcosm depicting the macrocosm in a very powerful image we're familiar with Robert Flood's cosmic diagram, one of the frontispieces of his work, Etrusky Cosmi, or History of the Macrocosm and Microcosm, a great series of volumes to do with the teachings of the ages that he was compiling. And it dates from 1617 to 1626, not so long after the Fama Fraternitatis. And you notice the way that Flood has had his picture of the human here depicted in the microcosm is very much associated with a Vitruvius and earlier authors depicted the, the, um, <clears throat> the human being in the ideal proportions uh, based on the ancient text of Vitruvius who was following even earlier traditions. If we zoom in even more on this cosmic diagram of flood or some would say a cosmogram, you'll see there that there's a sim plan planetary symbols, there's the signs of the zodiac you know, zodiacal signs uh, with lines to various parts that are associated with our human body and its operations and its guidance. We see here also the from the Pseudo Dionysus mystical text, the ninefold layer levels of the angelic hierarchy listed here. We also see various levels of mind depiction from reason into the higher cosmic mind and higher mystical states are referred to through the words on these outer three circles. We also find the four traditional fluids of the body that are depicted here in the one, two, three, four, the black circle for the black bile in the human being. And those had to be in harmony and balance in the microcosm for health spoken by Gallen and Paracelsius and Robert Flood and others. And we see this culminates in the triangles here with great lights and radiation of, of well-being that's associated with the divine within and the macrocosm. This diagram like Leonardo da Vinci's and Hakkinson's work, depiction of the human, we're seeing ourselves, our true nature of the mas master women mirrored in the cosmos here. Another work associated with Hakkinson's uh, digital uh, work is the Jacob Bohm's great cosmic diagram that we spoke of in some detail in the Department of Instruction teleconference meditation in depth four that you can see again on Rosicrucian TV on YouTube. And it's from his book, The Threefold Life. And again, we see symbolisms of a Kabbalistic, zodiacal and alchemical nature and the yod he vahe triangle, very similar to Flood's di diagram, the Tetratramicon at the, at the very center of the totality of everything. This is associated also, you'll notice, with a great spiraling action inward we did in our meditation, but also associated with uh, again the Sims work on universal transmissions. So if we pull all these things together, you notice here various wonderful depictions of a microcosm. And so the inspiring and intriguing image that's at the center here you see has various profound repercussions or relationships to earlier spiritual works that we know of. Particularly the vault of CRC, as we see a great fault here with all knowledge and laws and principles and the microcosm, the macrocosm, particularly see this wonderful frontispiece of the cosmic diagram of Robert Flood. Pulling this all together, in a way, we see an inspiring depiction of ourselves and our true nature, and the full range of vibrations on all the octaves of the cosmic. And as we rise up into the cosmic, we activate all the spiritual centers of the body in the east, these the system of the chakras, 
the Rosicrucians use a system of the psychic centers, the seven main ones, and an additional five with a 12 fold structure of the universe. Here we see a wonderful marriage of art and science and spirituality akin to what Vitruvius and Robert Flood and Leonardo da Vinci did. Let us consider also some other types of microcosm and macrocosms. As we depicted in the science here, let's look at one that's of a highly scientific nature associated with statistics. I know many of you have studied statistics and learned about survey sampling, where we have a population I'm trying to make inferences about, let's say all adults, persons 18 years and over in a particular country, United States, and you want to find out information about them, you want to ask them questions. It may be too exhaustive to ask them all that, except in the case when the census is done in some countries, such as every 10 years, depending on the country, every five years. The way you can do that, get that inference, is, is to create a microcosm. The population is the macrocosm or the universe, to use statistical terminology. Make a random sample selection of those peoples, maybe random digit dialing or a random selection of a great list, a frame of addresses or other means. And one can get a representative sample, and it could be stratified so that you get a representative sample based on people's ages and age brackets or their incomes, or their genders, and so forth. And now you have a much smaller set here, but you can make it, and you ask people your questions or study them, and lo and behold, if the random selection has been done well, the results here will represent the entirety of the population, and one can make inferences this way. This is one of the main methods that are used in science and statistical investigations, but it's using the idea that the macrocosm is mirrored in the microcosm and the microcosm is mirrored in the macrocosm. Another scientific principle that this is this law of correspondence is applied in is the hologram, where information and image in 2D has all can give rise to a three-dimensional image here. For example, in this two-dimensional surface giving rise to a globe of the earth. And intriguingly, an individual part of a hologram contains the, all the information to reconstruct the entire image. So that's, that section of the hologram is like a microcosm of a macrocosm, just like the microcosm can reconstruct the entirety of the macrocosm. I know many of you are intrigued too by this concept of the hologram. The physicists, for example, Gerard de Hoff and Leonard Susskind and others, developed a holographic theory of the universe where information on the two-dimensional surface gives, is, can, uh, gives a reconstruction or gives the information necessary to construct the three-dimensional shape of the universe. Again, these are subtle ways that science are applying the law of correspondence. Let's consider some other ways that the law of correspondence or the mirror of the macrocosm and the microcosm appears. Very common ways are, for example, in mandalas, spiritual diagrams to, for meditation. Um, one that's an associate in the West is that of the heavenly Jerusalem that's spoken of in the book of Revelation. Here it shows the, apost the apostles in the gates uh, and their respective precious stones above their heads. And they match actually earlier structures in the Bible. Uh, for example, the encampment of the children of Israel, their encampment in the wilderness, or also Solomon's temple and the structure of the tabernacle. These are all spiritual diagrams that one would have a spiritual teacher, teacher to be initiated into through an oral tradition of meditation associated with sacred text of the Bible. We know this is a macrocosm because it's the heaven, it's it's the it's the heavenly city taken through the heavens. And as in earlier cosmologies, there's the 12 gates that the sun would pass through associated with the 12 zodiacal signs. We find the measurement read here that's associated with an earlier times before surveying of a new city or temple would be done. There'd be augurs would immediately see the temple in the sky, particularly through the Etruscan tradition that the Romans learned from. They would bring the sacred emblem of the macrocosm down to earth to be sacred and habitable, just as the heavenly Jerusalem 
descends in John's vision in the book of Revelation. All these different levels, working with the microcosm, the macrocosm for a meditation technique. Another instance of the microcosm and the macrocosm is the botanical garden. Here we see depicted for us a founded in 1545 botanical garden of Padua. And it's thought to be the oldest academic garden in the world. Botanical gardens are for scientific study and systematic study. Botanical gardens were very important to healers like uh, in the Rosicrucian tradition, such as Paracelsus or Dr. Robert Flood, because they would get their herbs and their various materials for healing, as well as their psychic and mystical methods in conjunction from a botanical gardens. Indeed, with Magister Kelpius and other Rosicrucians came first to Phil where we become Philadelphia. One of the first things they did was to create uh, one of the earliest botanical gardens of Europeans uh, in North America. We'll see here the structure of it. It takes a fourfold structure because we know in the writings of historical nature about um, botanical gardens that they specifically say they're, they're creating a microcosm mirroring the macrocosm. Typically with great voyages that Europeans were doing to the four quarters of the world, they would have uh, plants from, Af from Africa or from uh, North America from other parts of the, of the West and so forth for the four, and the Asia for the four quarters of the world. You see here a picture of it done in a three, uh, 3D. Another depiction of it, of this great world, it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. You'll see an aerial view on the lush green uh, down, down below. Again, if you walked in this garden in a way, you're walking in a microcosm of the macrocosm. Another application of the principle of the correspondent correspondences is in the idea of the sacred city. We know from ancient times in Asia, for example, in the Hindu Vedic texts, but also in Confucian texts, the, and also in the West through the Roman tradition and the Egyptian tradition, the laying out of the city was laying out on the ground a model of the cosmos. And this was done as a temple. We think of the built form of the temple of uh, being a church or a cathedral or a synagogue or an Egyptian temple, but also our human body as a microcosm. But the city was also a temple on a much larger scale and followed similar, similar geometric principles. Here we find a diagram from the traditional Rosicrucian Johann Valentine Andrea's book, Christianopolis, which is a utopia holding up to humanity an ideal way of living, just like a recent manifesto of the Rosicrucians it gives the Rosicrucian utopia. And as much earlier times, Plato gave the utopia in his Atlantis, description of Atlantis, but also the Republic. This drawing is from 1619. And you notice it has a, a psychocosmogram pattern. The very center is a, is a temple, just like the heart at our center. And in the diagram here, it was orderly laid out of where the persons and the different workers and the government would be in their crafts and layout. Somewhat similar to Maso Campanella's City of the Sun and various other inspiring utopias uh, that have been given to inspire and give guidance and direction, but again, applying the law of the correspondence, the microcosm and the macrocosm. Another microcosm that we may not have realized but have been profoundly affected on are what's called the cabinets of curiosity or their later day forms that you've often been in. This is a frontispiece from the Museum Ormamium, depicting old worms, cabinet of curiosities. This book, as the title indicates here, Musea Romana Historia. This idea that you could have various samples and specimens from various parts of the world, the four quarters of the world. They spoke of creating cabinets of curiosities, originally on small scales and actual small cabinets, but then rooms like we see here, and then larger depicted again in museums. Even the etymology of the word comes from the muse, the deeper spiritual conveyance. But the idea was that the cabinet of curiosity ultimately becoming the museum would be a microcosm and macrocosm for the edification of humanity. You'll notice here, the rotunda ceiling of the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Depicted here are the various parts of the four quarters of the world. 
and from ancient times, the Egyptian motifs and uh, earlier uh, motifs associated with Assyria. And if you zoom up on this fourfold structure, the four structures of the cosmos, the, the earlier great entrance of this museum, you'll see that there's an inscription there that all men may know his work, that all persons may know the macrocosm. It's a, it's a, you'll recognize it's a biblical quote from Job 37, seven. But again, here's explicitly that idea of the museum being a microcosm. Another place where microcosm and macrocosms come up, and I'll mention a few more, but there's many, many more that I could have spoken of, is often in the arts and the crafts. But here we see a Persian rug, the great Ardabil carpet that's in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, England. It's huge. It's 34 feet, three inches by about 17 feet, seven inches. It's paired with a carpet that was made with it that's now in the Los Angeles County uh, Museum of Art. It was made in the town, Ardabil, and there's many rugs by that name if you go to a, a carpet or rug store today. It's in the northwest of Iran. And now this was a place for the burial of the uh, Sheikh Saf al Din Ardabili, who passed through transition, passed away in 1334. Now, the Sheikh was a Sufi leader, a mystic leader in Islam, an ancestor of the Shah Ismail, which is, is, well, is associated with the mystical form of, of Islam. And he was the founder of the Sufi the dynasty that dates from 1501 to 1722. Now, while, while the exact origins of this carpet are still being determined, it's thought to have been commissioned by the court for a shrine, so it has a sacred context of the shack, which by the 16th century had become a place of pilgrimage. Now, one of the iconographic identifications and interpretations of this um, great carpet is that it's associated with sun gates. There's the four sun gates associated with the four directions, but also those four important junctures of the, of the sun's movement about the solar system with the two solstices and the two equinoxes, but also here at the center of the cosmos. Um, and it's, you'll notice that it has a um, sacred geometric structure, similar to what would be in, a sh in the shrines in the shrine's dome. Also part of the symbolism and meaning of a, of a um, maybe these carpets where there are prayer rugs, many have a, um, a, a particular direction that you would sit on that be associated with the Qibla or the direction towards Mecca. And we know from our English word paradise is derived through etymology or der word derivations with the uh, Arabic word for paradise and garden. Indeed, in Arabic, in these tradition, these traditions, garden and paradise were um, the, same, the same word, and this rug can be and carpet can be viewed as a recreation of paradise, the original divine estate. The uh, Sufian uh, professor, the same Nasser, has written extensively on arts and sciences and Sufism of his. Um, culture of Persia and Islam talks about to sit on a Persian carpet is to be transported to par paradise. And that's from that connection of the uh, microcosm and the macrocosm. Now, it's also notable that there is a quote um, inscription here. You'll see the lamps here, you have here, but there's also an inscription. If we zoom in on it, it says in Arabic, Except for thy threshold, there is no refuge for me in all the world. Except for this door, there is no resting place for my head. The work of the slave of the portal, Asqued Keshani. So you see here a, sac a sacred description of being in the presence of Allah or the presence of the divine. And this carpet is to suggest that in its being a microcosm of the macrocosm. You see, the wonderful work again, a tre tremendous artistry 
that would be a wonderful accompaniment for the sacred shrine. Now there's one last microcosm I want to mention to you before we conclude, and it's the river cosmogram by the artist Houston Conwell, who lived from 1947 to 2016. It was done in 1992, and it was done as a tribute to the poet and writer Langston Hughes, who lived from 1901 to 1967. And it's also a tribute to his poem, A Negro Speaks of Rivers. And it's this uh, cosmogram, that's how it's referred to, it's not just me, is in the Langston Hughes lobby in the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture at 515 Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem in Manhattan. Now, it's a cosmogram depicting the poem by Langston Hughes and some of the great rivers of the world. But it's also both the great journey that was made from Africa to North America by Africans come to dwell in Harlem. And Langston Hughes' poem was part of the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s uh, and later. We have here, as part of the basis for this work, by um, Houston Conwell and also by the architect um, Joseph the Pace, um, and uh, also by Estella Conwell and Josie. You see a screen print that's actually on a piece of paper that's about uh, 32, well, actually about 33 inches square, and it depicts various rivers of the world, but also links it in with text from Langston Hughes' poem and also ties it in with Harlem and that great journey from Africa to New, um, North America. So pulling these things together, you see in a way this is a prep, a work on a smaller scale that matches the large cosmogram at the Schomburg Center. Many have commented that actually these diagrams are uh, seem to be influenced by the Congo cosmogram or cross that represents the cycles of human life and rebirth of the soul and the rising of the setting sun in African spirituality, especially associated with the Congo. Here's a depiction, the closing here, zooming up on it. You see more lines of text from the poem by Langston Hughes, various diagrams for guiding persons um, from the uh, Africa to the Harlem, and to the north in the United States, but also uh, we see great motion of actions of the of the rivers and the play of light over different times of day uh, uh, in in this particular room. I want to conclude on this uh, rivers cosmogram by actually reading to you a poem by Langston Hughes entitled "The Negro Speaks of Rivers," and he did this when he was a young man around 20 years of age, recently finished high school and he was traveling to see his father in Mexico. And the train was traveling over and by the Mississippi River. And he wrote on the letter envelope from his father, I've known rivers. I've known rivers ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young, I built my hut in the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised the pyramids above it. I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. And as it says at the center, the cosmogram, my soul has grown deep like the rivers. So today, brothers and sorrows and participants, we've covered one of the most important Rosicrucian laws, the, the law of correspondence of the microcosm and macrocosm. It's, not, it's a key to harmonious living, and it's a key to those questions that were posed by Paul Gauguin 
and by philosophers and seekers from time immemorial about where we come from and what are we and whence we're going. And in that, in our treatment with the cosmic through the meditation exercises in the Akshara order, we come into a deep understanding of these questions and can help others come to, into them as well. I, think, I thank you for your participation today and encourage you always to be cognizant of all the microcosms that are around us, for they are, we are mirrored in them always. And this is deeply meaningful for our passage in life. Thank you.